1Q84 by Haruki Murakami Book 1, Chapter 3 Aomame, Some Changed Facts Aomame climbed down the emergency stairway in her stocking feet. The wind whistled past the stairway, which was open to the elements. Snug though her miniskirt was, it filled like a sail with the occasional strong gust from below, providing enough lift to make her steps unsteady. She kept a tight grip on the cold metal pipe that served as a handrail, lowering herself a step at a time, backward and stopping now and again to brush aside the stray hair hanging down her forehead and to adjust the position of the shoulder bag slung diagonally across her chest. She had a sweeping view of National Highway 246 running below. The din of the city enveloped her, car engines, blaring horns and the scream of an automobile burglar alarm. An old war song echoing from a right-wing sound truck, a sledgehammer cracking concrete. Riding on the wind, the noise pressed in on her from all directions, above, below, and 360 degrees around. Listening to the racket, not that she wanted to listen, but she was in no position to be covering her ears, she began to feel almost seasick. Part way down, the stairs became a horizontal catwalk, leading back toward the center of the elevated expressway, then angled straight down again. Just across the road from the open stairway stood a small, five-story apartment house, a relatively new building covered in brown brick tile. Each apartment had a small balcony facing the emergency stairway, but all the patio doors were shut tight, the blinds or curtains closed. What kind of architect puts balconies on a building that stands nose to nose with an elevated expressway? No one would be hanging out their sheets to dry or lingering on the balcony with a gin and tonic to watch the evening rush hour traffic. Still, on several balconies were stretched the seemingly obligatory nylon clotheslines, and one even had a garden chair and potted rubber plant. The rubber plant was ragged and faded, its leaves disintegrating and marked with brown, dry spots. Aomame could not help feeling sorry for the plant. If she were ever reincarnated, let her not be reborn as such a miserable rubber plant. Judging from the spider webs clinging to it, the emergency stairway was hardly ever used. To each web clung a small black spider patiently waiting for its small prey to come along. Not that the spiders had any awareness of being patient. A spider had no special skill other than building its web, and no lifestyle choice other than sitting still. It would stay in one place waiting for its prey, until, in the natural course of things, it shriveled up and died. This was all genetically predetermined. The spider had no confusion, no despair, no regrets, no metaphysical doubt, no moral complications, probably. Unlike me, I have to move with a purpose, which is why I'm alone now, climbing down these stupid emergency stairs from Metropolitan Expressway number 3 where it passes through the useless Sangenjaya neighborhood, 
even if it means ruining a perfectly good pair of stockings, all the while sweeping away these damned spiderwebs and looking at an ugly rubber plant on somebody's stupid balcony. I move, therefore I am. Climbing down the stairway, Aomame thought about Tamaki Otsuka. She had not been intending to think about Tamaki, but once the thoughts began, she couldn't stop them. Tamaki was her closest friend in high school and a fellow member of the softball team. As teammates, they went to many different places and did all kinds of things together. They once shared a kind of lesbian experience. The two of them took a summer trip and ended up sleeping together, when a small double was the only size bed the hotel could offer. They found themselves touching each other all over. Neither of them was a lesbian, but spurred on by the special curiosity of two young girls, they experimented boldly. Neither had a boyfriend at the time, and neither had the slightest sexual experience. It was simply one of those things that remain as an exceptional but interesting episode in life. But as she brought back the images of herself and Tamaki touching each other that night, Aomame felt some small, deep parts of herself growing hot, even as she made her way down the windswept stairway. Tamaki's oval-shaped nipples, her sparse pubic hair, the lovely curve of her buttocks, the shape of her clitoris. Aomame recalled them with all strange clarity. As her mind traced these graphic memories, the brass unison of Janacek's Sinfonietta rang like festive background music. The palm of her hand was caressing the curve of Tamaki's waist. At first, Tamaki just laughed as if she were being tickled, but soon the laughter stopped and her breathing changed. The music had initially been composed as a fanfare for an athletic meet. The breeze brewed gently over the green meadows of Bohemia in time with the music. Aomame knew when Tamaki's nipples suddenly became erect, and then her own did the same, and then the timpani conjured up a complex musical pattern. Aomame halted her steps and shook her head several times. I should not be thinking such thoughts at a time like this. I have to concentrate on climbing down the stairs. But the thoughts would not go away. The images came to her one after another and with great vividness. The summer night, the narrow bed, the faint smell of perspiration, the words they spoke, the feelings that would not take the form of words, forgotten promises, unrealized hopes, frustrated longings. A gust of wind lifted a lock of her hair and whipped it against her cheek. The pain brought a film of tears to her eyes. Successive gusts soon dried the tears away. When did that happen, I wonder? but time became confused in her memory, like a tangled string. The straight line axis was lost, and forward and back, right and left, jumbled together. One drawer took the place of another. She could not recall things that should have come back to her easily. It is now... April 1984, I was born in, that's it, 1954, I can remember that much. 
these dates were engraved in her mind, but as soon as she recalled them, they lost all meaning. She saw white cards imprinted with dates scattering in the wind, flying in all directions. She ran, trying to pick up as many as she could, but the wind was too strong. The sheer number of cards overwhelming. Away they flew, 1954, 1984, 1645, 1881, 2006, 771, 2041. All order lost, all knowledge vanishing, the stairway of intellection crumbling beneath her feet. Aomame and Tamaki were in bed together. They were seventeen and enjoying their newly granted freedom. This was their first trip together as friends, just the two of them. That fact alone was exciting. They soaked in the hotel's hot spring, split a can of beer from the refrigerator, turned out the lights and crawled into bed. They were just kidding around at first, poking each other for the fun of it. But at some point, Tamaki reached out and grabbed Aomame's nipple through the t-shirt she wore as pajamas. An electric shock ran through Aomame's body. Eventually, they stripped off their shirts and panties and were naked in the summer night. Where did we go on that trip? She could not recall. It didn't matter. Soon, without either of them being the first to suggest it, they were examining each other's bodies down to the smallest detail. Looking, touching, caressing, kissing, licking, half in jest, half seriously. Tamaki was small and a bit plump, with large breasts. Aomame was taller, lean and muscular, with smaller breasts. Tamaki always talked about going on a diet, but Aomame found her attractive just the way she was. Tamaki's skin was soft and fine. Her nipples swelled in a beautiful oval shape reminiscent of olives. Her pubic hair was fine and sparse, like a delicate willow tree. Aomame's was hard and bristly. They laughed at the difference. They experimented with touching each other in different places and discussed which areas were the most sensitive. Some areas were the same, others were not. Each held out a finger and touched the other's clitoris. Both girls had experienced masturbation, a lot, but now they saw how different it was to be touched by someone else. The breeze swept across the meadows of Bohemia. Aomame came to a stop and shook her head again. She released a deep sigh and tightened her grip on the metal pipe handrail. I have to stop thinking about these things. I have to concentrate on climbing down the stairs. By now, I must be more than halfway down. Still, why is there so much noise here? Why is the wind so strong? They both seem to be reprimanding me, punishing me. Setting such immediate sensory impressions aside, Almame began to worry about what might await her at the bottom of the stairway. What if someone were there, demanding that she identify herself and explain her presence? Could she get by with a simple explanation? The traffic was backed up on the expressway, and I have such urgent business that I climb down the stairs. Or would there be complications? She didn't want any complications. Not today. Fortunately, she found no one at ground level to challenge her. The first thing she did 
was pull her shoes from her bag and step into them. The stairway came down to a vacant patch beneath the elevated expressway, a storage area for construction materials hemmed in between the inbound and outbound lanes of Route 246 and surrounded by high metal sheeting. A number of steel poles lay on the bare ground, rusting, probably discarded surplus from some construction job. A makeshift plastic roof covered one part of the area where three cloth sacks lay piled. Aomame had no idea what they held, but they had been further protected from the rain by a vinyl cover. The sacks, too, seemed to be construction surplus, thrown there at the end of the job, because they were too much trouble to haul away. Beneath the roof, several crushed, corrugated cartons some plastic drink bottles, and a number of manga magazines lay on the ground. Aside from a few plastic shopping bags that were being whipped around by the wind, there was nothing else down here. The area had a metal gate, but a large padlock and several wrappings of chain held it in place. The gate towered over her and was topped with barbed wire. There was no way she could climb over it. Even if she managed to do so, her suit would be torn to shreds. She gave it a few tentative shakes, but it wouldn't budge. There was not even enough space for a cat to squeeze through. Damn. What was the point of locking the place so securely? There was nothing here worth stealing. She frowned and cursed and even spit on the ground. After all her trouble to climb down from the elevated expressway, now she was locked in a storage yard. She glanced at her watch. The time was still okay. But she couldn't go on hanging around in this place forever. And doubling back to the expressway now was out of the question. The heels of both her stockings were ripped checking to make sure that there was no one watching her. She slipped out of her high heels, rolled up her skirt, pulled her stockings down, yanked them off her feet, and stepped into her shoes again. The tore stockings she shoved into her bag. This calmed her somewhat. Now she walked the perimeter of the storage area, paying close attention to every detail. It was about the size of an elementary school classroom, so a full circuit of the place took no time at all. Yes, she had already found the only exit, the locked gate. The metal sheeting that enclosed the space was thin, but the pieces were securely bolted together, and the bolts could not be loosened without tools. Time to give up. She went over to the roofed area for a closer look at the crushed cartons. They had been arranged as bedding, she realized, with a number of worn blankets rolled up inside. They were not all that old either. Some street people were probably sleeping here, which explained the bottles and magazines, no doubt about it. El Mame put her mind to work. If they were using this place to spend their nights, it must have some kind of secret entrance. They're good at finding hidden places to ward off the wind and rain, she thought. And they know how to secure secret passageways, like animal trails, for their exclusive use. Aomame made another round, closely inspecting each metal sheet of the fence and giving it a shake. As she expected, she found one loose spot where a bolt might have slipped out. She tried bending it in different directions. If you changed the angle a little and pulled it inward, a space opened up that was just big enough for a person to squeeze through. 
The street people probably came in after dark to enjoy sleeping under the roof, but they would have problems if someone caught them in here. So they went out during the daylight hours to find food and collect empty bottles for spare change. Aomame inwardly thanked the nameless nighttime residents as someone who had to move stealthily, anonymously, behind the scenes in the big city, she felt at one with them. She crouched down and slipped through the narrow gap, taking great care to avoid catching and tearing her expensive suit on any sharp objects. It was not her favorite suit. It was the only one she owned. She almost never dressed this way, and she never wore heels. Sometimes, however, this particular line of work required her to dress respectably, so she had to avoid ruining the suit. Fortunately, there was no one outside the fence either. She checked her clothing once more, resumed a calm expression on her face, and walked to a corner with a traffic signal, crossing Route 246. She entered a drug store and bought a new pair of stockings, which she put on in a back room with the permission of the girl at the register. This improved her mood considerably and obliterated the slightest discomfort, like seasickness, that had remained in her stomach. Thanking the clerk, she left the store. The traffic on Route 246 was heavier than usual probably because word had spread that an accident had stopped traffic on the parallel urban expressway. El Mame abandoned the idea of taking a cab and decided instead to take the Tokyo Shin Tamagawa line from a nearby station. That would be a sure thing. She had had enough of taxis stuck in traffic. As she headed for Sangenjaya Station, she passed a policeman on the street. He was a tall, young officer, walking rapidly, heading somewhere in particular. She tensed up for a moment, but he looked straight ahead, apparently in too much of a hurry even to glance at her. Just before they passed each other, Aomame noticed that there was something unusual about his uniform. The jacket was the normal deep navy blue, but its cut was different. The design was more casual, less tight-fitting and in a softer material. The lapels smaller, even the navy colour a touch paler. His pistol too was a different model. He wore a large automatic at his waist instead of the revolver normally issued to policemen in Japan. Crimes involving firearms were so rare in this country that there was little likelihood that an officer would be caught in a shootout, which meant an old-fashioned six-shooter was adequate. Revolvers were simply made, cheap, reliable, and easy to maintain. But for some reason, this officer was carrying the latest model semi-automatic pistol the kind that could be loaded with 16 9mm bullets, probably a Glock or a Beretta. But how could that be? How could police uniforms and pistols have changed without her being aware of it? It was practically unthinkable. She read the newspaper closely each day. Changes like that would have been featured prominently, and besides, she paid careful attention to police uniforms. Until this morning, just a few hours ago, policemen were still wearing the same old stiff uniforms they always had, and still carrying the same old unsophisticated revolvers. She remembered them clearly. It was very strange. But Aomame was in no frame of mind to think deeply about such matters. She had a job to do. When the subway reached Shibuya Station, she deposited her coat in a coin locker, then hurried up. 
Dogenzaka toward the hotel, wearing only her suit. It was a decent enough hotel. Nothing fancy, but well equipped, clean with reputable guests. It had a restaurant on the street level, as well as a convenience store close to the station, a good location. She walked in and headed straight for the ladies' room. Fortunately, it was empty. The first thing she did was sit down for a good, long pee, eyes closed, listening to the sound like distant surf, and thinking of nothing in particular. Next, she stood at one of the sinks and washed her hands well with soap and water. She brushed her hair and blew her nose. She took out her toothbrush and did a cursory brushing without toothpaste. She had no time to floss. It wasn't that important. She wasn't preparing for a date. She faced the mirror and added a touch of lipstick and eyebrow pencil. Removing her suit jacket, she adjusted the position of her underwire bra, smoothed the wrinkles in her white blouse, and sniffed her armpits. No smell. Then she closed her eyes and recited the usual prayer, the words of which meant nothing. The meaning didn't matter. Reciting was the important thing. After the prayer, she opened her eyes and looked at herself in the mirror. Fine. The picture of the capable businesswoman, erect posture, firm mouth, only the big, bulky shoulder bag seemed out of place. A slim attaché case might have been better, but this bag was more practical. She checked again to make sure she had all the items she needed in the bag. No problem. Everything was where it belonged. Easy to find by touch. Now it was just a matter of carrying out the task as arranged. Head on. With unwavering conviction and ruthlessness. Almame undid the top button of her blouse. This would give a glimpse of cleavage when she bent over. If only she had more cleavage to expose. No one challenged her as she took the elevator to the fourth floor, walked down the corridor, and quickly found room 426. Taking a clipboard from the bag, she clutched it to her chest and knocked on the door. A light, crisp knock. A brief wait. Another knock. This one a little harder. Grumbling from inside. Door opened a crack. Man's face, maybe forty. Marine blue shirt, grey flannel slacks. Classic look of a businessman, working with his tie and jacket off. Red eyes, annoyed, probably sleep deprived. He seemed surprised to see Omame in her business suit, probably expecting her to be a maid here to replenish the minibar. I'm terribly sorry to disturb you, sir. My name is Ito, and I'm a member of the hotel management staff. There's been a problem with the air conditioner, and I need to do an inspection. May I come in? It won't take more than five minutes, Aomame announced briskly with a sweet smile. The man squinted at her in obvious displeasure. I'm working on something important. A rush job. I'll be leaving the room in another hour. Can I get you to come back then? There's nothing wrong with the air conditioner in this room. I'm terribly sorry, sir. It's an emergency involving a short circuit. We need to take care of it as soon as possible, for safety's sake. We're going from room to room. It won't even take five minutes. Ah, what the hell, said the man with a click of his tongue. I made a point of taking a room so I could work undisturbed. He pointed to the papers on the desk, a pile of detailed charts and graphs he had printed out, 
probably materials he was preparing for a late meeting. He had a computer and a calculator and scratch paper with long lines of figures. Almame knew that he worked for a corporation connected with oil. He was a specialist on capital investment in a number of Middle Eastern countries. According to the information she had been given, he was one of the more capable men in the field. She could see it in the way he carried himself. He came from a good family, earned a sizable income, and drove a new Jaguar. After a pampered childhood, he had gone to study abroad, spoke good English and French, and exuded self-confidence. He was the type who could not bear to be told what to do, or to be criticised, especially if the criticism came from a woman. He had no difficulty bossing others around, though, and cracking a few of his wife's ribs with a golf club was no problem at all. As far as he was concerned, the world revolved around him, and without him, the earth didn't move at all. He could become furious, violently angry, if anyone interfered with what he was doing, or contradicted him in any way. Sorry to trouble you, sir, our mummy said, flashing him her best business smile. As if it were a fait accompli, she squeezed halfway into the room, pressing her back against the door, readied her clipboard and started writing something on it with a ballpoint pen. That was, uh, Mr. Miyama, I believe? She asked. Having seen his photo any number of times, she knew his face well, but it wouldn't hurt to make sure she had the right person. There was no way to correct a mistake. Yes, of course. Miyama, he said, curtly. He followed this with a resigned sigh that seemed to say, All right, do as you damn please. He took his seat at the desk and, with a ballpoint pen in one hand, picked up whatever document he had been reading. His suit coat and a striped tie lay on the fully made double bed where he had thrown them. They were both, obviously, very expensive. Aomame walked straight for the closet, her bag hanging from her shoulder. She had been told that the air conditioner switch panel was in there. Inside, she found a trench coat of soft material and a dark grey cashmere scarf. The only luggage was a leather briefcase, no change of clothes, no bag for toiletries. He was probably not planning to stay the night. On the desk stood a coffee pot that had obviously been delivered by room service. She pretended to inspect the switch panel for 30 seconds and then called out to Miyama. Thank you, Mr. Miyama, for your cooperation. I can't find any problem with the equipment in this room. Which is what I was trying to tell you from the start, he grumbled. Uh, Mr. Miyama? she ventured. Excuse me, but I think you have something stuck in the back of your neck. The back of my neck? he said. He rubbed the area and then stared at the palm of his hand. I don't think so. Please, let me just have a look, she said, drawing closer. Do you mind? Sure, go ahead, he said, looking puzzled. What is it? A spot of paint, I think. Bright green. Paint? I'm not really sure. Judging from the colour, it has to be paint. Is it all right if I touch you back there? It might come right off. Well, okay, Miyama said, ducking his head forward, exposing the back of his neck to Aomame. It was bare, thanks to what looked like a recent haircut. Aomame took a deep breath and held it, concentrating her attention on her fingers nimble search for the right spot. She pressed a fingertip there as if to mark the place, then closed her eyes, confirming that her touch was not mistaken. Yes, this is it. 
I'd like to take more time if possible to make doubly certain, but it's too late for that now. I'll just have to do my best with the situation I've been given. Sorry, sir, but do you mind holding that position a bit longer? I'll take a pen light from my bag. The lighting in here is not very good. Why would I have paint back there, of all things? I don't know, sir. I'll check it right away. Keeping her finger pressed against the spot on the man's neck, El Mame drew a hard plastic case from her bag, opened it, and took out an object wrapped in thin cloth. With a few deft movements, she unfolded the cloth, revealing something like a small ice pick about four inches in length with a compact wooden handle. It looked like an ice pick, but it was not meant for cracking ice. Aomame had designed and made it herself. The tip was as sharp and pointed as a needle, and it was protected from breakage by a small piece of cork. Cork that had been specially processed to make it as soft as cotton. She carefully plucked the cork from the point and slipped it into her pocket. She then held the exposed point against that special spot on Miyama's neck. Calm down now. This is it. Aomame told herself. I can't be off by even one hundredth of an inch. One slip and all my efforts will be wasted. Concentration is the key. How much longer is this going to take? Miyama protested. I'm sorry, sir. I'll be through in a moment. Don't worry, she said to him silently. It'll all be over before you know it. Wait just a second or two. Then you won't have to think about a thing. You won't have to think about the oil refining system or crude oil market trends or quarterly reports to the investors or Bahrain flight reservations or bribes for officials or presents for your mistress. What a strain it must have been for you to keep these things straight in your head all this time. So please, just wait a minute. I'm hard at work here giving it all the concentration I can muster. Don't distract me, that's all I ask. Once she had settled on the location and set her mind to the task, El Mame raised her right palm in the air, held her breath, and after a brief pause, brought it straight down, not too forcefully, against the wooden handle. If she applied too much force, the needle might break under the skin, and leaving the needle tip behind was out of the question. The important thing was to bring the palm down lightly, almost tenderly, at exactly the right angle, with exactly the right amount of force, without resisting gravity, straight down, as if the fine point of the needle were being sucked into the spot with the utmost naturalness, deeply, smoothly, and with fatal results. The angle and force, or rather the restraint of force, were crucial. As long as she was careful about those things, it was as simple as driving a needle into a block of tofu. The needle pierced the skin thrust into the special spot at the base of the brain, and stopped the heart as naturally as blowing out a candle. Everything ended in a split second, almost too easily. Only our mame could do this. No one else could find that subtle point by touch. Her fingertips possessed the special intuition that made it possible. She heard him draw a sharp breath, then every muscle in his body went stiff. Instantly, she withdrew the needle, and just as quickly, took out the small gauze pad she had ready in her pocket, pressing it against the wound to prevent the flow of blood. 
because the needle was so fine and had remained in his skin for no more than a few seconds, only a minuscule amount of blood could possibly escape through the opening. But she had to take every precaution. She must not leave even the slightest trace of blood. One drop could ruin everything. Caution was Almami's specialty. The strength began to drain from Miyama's body, which had momentarily stiffened, like air going out of a basketball. Keeping her finger on the spot on his neck, Almami let him slump forward onto the desk. His face lay sideways, pillowed on his documents. His eyes were wide open in apparent surprise, as if his last act had been to witness something utterly amazing. They showed neither fear nor pain, only pure surprise. Something out of the ordinary was happening to him, but he could not comprehend what it was. A pain, an itch, a pleasure, or a divine revelation? There were many different ways of dying in the world, perhaps none of them as easy as this. This was an easier death than you deserved, El Mami thought with a scowl. It was just too simple. I probably should have broken a few ribs for you with a five iron and given you plenty of pain before putting you out of your misery. That would have been the right kind of death for a rat like you. It's what you did to your wife. Unfortunately, however, the choice was not mine. My mission was to send this man to the other world as swiftly and surely and discreetly as possible. Now, I have accomplished that mission. He was alive until a moment ago, and now he's dead. He crossed the threshold separating life from death without being aware of it himself. Our mame held the gauze in place for a full five minutes patiently, but without pressing hard enough for her finger to leave an indentation. She kept her eyes glued on the second hand of her watch. It was a very long five minutes. If someone had walked in then and seen her pressing her finger against the man's neck while holding the slender murder weapon in the other hand, it would have been all over. She could never have talked her way out of it. A bellhop could bring a pot of fire. There could be a knock on the door at any moment, but this was an indispensable five minutes. To calm herself, our mommy took several slow, deep breaths. I can't get flustered now. I can't lose my composure. I have to stay the same calm, cool our mommy as always. She could hear her heart beating, and in her head, in time with the beat, resounded the opening fanfare of Janáček's Sinfonietta. Soft, silent breezes played across the green meadows of Bohemia. She was aware that she had become split in two. Half of her continued to press the dead man's neck with utter coolness. The other half was filled with fear. She wanted to drop everything and get out of this room now. I'm here, but I'm not here. I'm in two places at once. It goes against Einstein's theorem. But what the hell? Call it the Zen of the killer. The five minutes were finally up. But just to make sure, Al Mame gave it one more minute. I can wait another minute. The greater the rush, the more care one should take with the job. She endured the extra minute, which seemed as if it would never end. Then she slowly pulled her finger away and examined the wound with her pen light. A mosquito's stinger left a larger hole than this. Stabbing the special points at the base of the brain with an exceptionally fine needle causes a death that is almost 
indistinguishable from a natural, sudden death. It would look like a heart attack to most ordinary doctors. It hit him without warning while he was working at his desk, and he breathed his last breath. Overwork and stress. No sign of unnatural causes. No need for an autopsy. This man was a high-powered operator, but also prone to overwork. He earned a high salary, but he couldn't use it now that he was dead. He wore Armani suits and drove a Jaguar, but finally he was just another ant, working and working until he died without meaning. The very fact that he existed in this world would eventually be forgotten. Such a shame. He was so young, people might say. Or they might not. Aomame took the cork from her pocket and placed it on the needle. Wrapping the delicate instrument in the thin cloth again, she returned it to the hard case, which she placed in the bottom of the shoulder bag. She then took a hand towel from the bathroom and wiped any fingerprints she might have left in the room. These would all be on the air conditioner panel and the doorknob. She had been careful not to touch anything else. She returned the towel to the bathroom. Placing the man's cup and coffee pot on the room service tray, she set them in the corridor. This way, the bellhop would not have to knock when he came to retrieve them, and the discovery of the body would be delayed that much more. If all went well, the maid would find the body after checkout time tomorrow. When he failed to show up at tonight's meeting, people might ring the room, but there would be no answer. They might think it odd enough to have the manager open the room, but then again, they might not. Things would simply take their course. Almame stood before the bathroom mirror to make sure nothing about her clothing was in disarray. She closed the top button of her blouse. She had not had to flash cleavage. The bastard had hardly looked at her. What the hell did other people mean to him? She tried out a medium frown. Then she straightened her hair massaged her facial muscles with her fingertips to soften them, and flashed the mirror a sweet smile, revealing her recently cleaned white teeth. All right then, here I go, out of the dead man's room and back to the real world, time to adjust the atmospheric pressure. I'm not a cool killer anymore, just a smiling, capable businesswoman in a sharp suit. She opened the door a crack, checked to see that there was no one in the corridor, and slipped out. She took the stairs rather than the elevator. No one paid her any mind as she passed through the lobby. Posture erect, she stared straight ahead and walked quickly, though not quickly enough to attract attention. She was a pro, virtually perfect. If only her breasts were a little bigger, she thought with a twinge. She might have been truly perfect. A partial frown. But hell, you've got to work with what you've got. 